Um, the title of my talk is Blockchain for Supply Chain. Just to give a short intro about IOTEX before we get started. Um, IOTEX is, uh, has a vision for what we call the internet of trusted things. Uh, it's an open network where humans and machines can interact with guaranteed trust and privacy. So really the goal of our platform uh, is to enable trusted data from trusted devices for use in trusted applications. We want to make sure or like everyday people and everyday businesses can own and control their smart devices, as well as the data and value that they generate. Um, you know, I'm going to walk you through a little bit about the philosophy of why that matters. Um, but, you know, just a little bit more about IOTEX. We're fully open source, built 100% from scratch. So we didn't fork any other chains. You can check out our code at github.com slash IOTEX project. Um, you know, what really differentiates IOTEX is, you know, we have a very robust uh, layer one blockchain that we built from scratch, but we also layer on uh, IoT middleware and a very IoT oriented developer tools to make building uh, solutions on our platform simple and easy. So things like decentralized identity, we have our own decentralized identity spec um, uh, that covers both humans and devices. Uh, so it kind of uh, allowing devices to talk to each other and talk to other humans is a very important prerequisite for uh, kind of this autonomous future that we all envision. Uh, another thing is decentralized storage. Uh, we dabble in con uh, confidential computing and secure hardware. And I'm going to walk you through exactly, you know, one of these devices that we have is called Pebble Tracker. And it uses secure hardware uh, to sign and to store private keys and kind of connect the real world with the blockchain world. Um, on the dev tool side, you know, we have a lot of smart contract tools, integrated developer environments to make it easy to launch uh, EVM compatible smart contracts on IOTEX, uh, real world data oracles, et cetera. Um, you know, one thing that uh, you guys should know about IOTEX is um, we've been around since 2017 and we really take a research backed and academic approach to how we've designed our platform. So uh, IOTEX is currently leading uh, blockchain focus groups in a lot of the largest industry groups, uh, such as the Industrial Internet Consortium, uh, the IEEE. China Mobile IoT Alliance, we're the only block, the public blockchain in that group. Uh, and we also partner with uh, a variety of uh, device manufacturers and chip manufacturers. So since early 2019, we've been partnering with Nordic Semiconductor, uh, one of the largest cellular IoT kind of fabulous semiconductor manufacturers. Uh, we partner with WiseKey, who also does a lot of things in NFC um, and uh, uh, I guess just secure hardware in general. And finally, we know we worked with uh, a lot of different device manufacturers that you know look to IOTEX to provide new security and privacy for their products. So one of those products is called UCAM. It's actually the first blockchain-powered camera that delivers 100% privacy to users. Um, but that's not really the focus of my talk today. Uh, we really wanted to focus on. Um, yeah, just exactly how IOTEX uses blockchain in order to uh, uh, in, enable new supply chain capabilities, right? Um, so this is just kind of a schematic what the platform looks like. But before I dive into exactly what the solution looks like, I wanted to set some context around, you know, what is IOT and why is blockchain important for IOT? Um, you know, I think everyone has a general idea of what Internet of Things is. It's kind of this phenomenon of all these different smart devices uh, being used in our personal and professional lives today. Um, the way I think about IoT is kind of the gateway between the physical and the digital worlds. Um, everything from, uh, you know, cameras, uh, laptops, phones, sensors, uh, vehicles, uh, even the future things that will power our smart cities. You know, these are all uh, under the umbrella of the Internet of Things. But, you know, a lot of people think about IoT as a very diverse and uh, expansive ecosystem, but if you think about an IoT device at the core of what it does, the anatomy of that device is uh, very uh, similar to others, right? All devices have some type of sensor, uh, some type of wireless module to transmit that information uh, through uh, Wi-Fi or cellular or uh, low power long range or others. Uh, it has some type of battery and some type of power supply, and it has uh, some varying degrees of processing, compute, memory storage, Etc. Um, so when you think about it from that perspective, uh, it's important to understand that you know uh, generally these IoT devices are doing uh, three things, right? The goal of these devices is really to capture physical phenomena and transmit it 
or convert it into digital data that we can use to uh, enforce uh, different business logic or to progress workflows or simply just to visualize to provide more of a understanding of the physical world in a digital context. Um, so these three kind of steps are kind of standard for IoT devices as well, right? Or um, different types of IoT based solutions. So the, con the concept of acquiring data or uh, capturing data, you know, is through sensors. Uh, there's a lot of different types of sensors today, right? Whether it's GPS sensors, um, different types of climate sensors, uh, motion sensors through accelerometers and gyroscopes, uh, but even things like proximity sensors, smoke sensors, light sensors, al alcohol sensors, moisture sensors, all of these things are just kind of, uh, you know, uh, hardware that's specifically designed to read, again, physical phenomena or physical properties and convert them into da digital data that we can comprehend, right? Um, so this raw data is then processed, whether it's on the device itself uh, meaning on the edge or more uh, kind of transmitted to a cloud to do that processing. But, you know, all this data is, when it, in its raw form is not really useful, right? We have to make sure we aggregate it, we validate it, and we analyze it to extract uh, the value and the insights from that data. So some more powerful devices that are, you know, uh, not battery powered may do this uh, directly on the device. Some weaker battery powered devices like sensors that you deploy in the field that, you know, uh, turn on every hour, grab some data. Um, those things are not really suitable for uh, on-device processing, but uh, it's all depending on the architecture you have. And finally, you know, we, once this data is captured and maybe pre-processed, you need to uh, communicate it, transmit it uh, through a gateway or a cloud um, to reach the server that you want uh, to run your applications on, right? So this is kind of the traditional way of thinking about it. We always think about, you know, device to cloud, right? Um, a blockchain, you know, doesn't really change too much of this upfront process. You know, I think having blockchain can help you register these devices, make sure that the data coming into your cloud server is trusted. But the real magic is when you combine trusted data with a trusted execution uh, kind of platform. Uh, and that's exactly what blockchain does. So, Another concept that's really important to understand, you know, before I dive into the IOTech solutions is all about web 1.0 and web 2.0, right? Um, these kind of seem like buzzwords these days. You see it used a lot in different types of contexts, but it's really important to understand what these words mean and why they matter, right? So web 1.0 uh, started, you know, even in the 1990s and earlier around these open source standards that really power much of the internet today. Uh, things like TCP IP, domain name systems, UDP, HTTP, these are all types of open protocols and open standards on top of which a lot of the modern internet runs today, right? But this concept of Web 2.0 um, started, you know, uh, with the, the big tech companies like Google uh, in the dot-com boom around the 2000s, right? They started to build proprietary tech stacks on top of Web, web 1.0. So they're kind of leveraging the openness of Web 1.0, but they're building their own siloed products in different forms where they control the rules, they control the data, they control the value of their ecosystems, right? And, you know, for the past 20 years from maybe 2000 to 2020, uh, this has been okay with us, right? Generally, society has been thinking, okay, you know, all these new features, you know, it's, it's incredible to think that even 10 years ago, Spotify wasn't a thing, DoorDash wasn't a thing, um, you know, Uber was barely getting started. Um, but the evolution of what these web 2.0 tech giants have brought to us uh, has transformed the way we live and transformed a lot of the ways that society operates today, right? But we've gone to a kind of, we've approached a certain tipping point where web 2.0 has grown so large that, you know, just like um, some big banks are too big to fail, now we have tech companies that are too big to fail and extracting value from user data, um, you know, we don't have to remind everyone about that, the hacks and the things that have gone on from these kind of centralized um, uh, operations. But, you know, it's really important to understand that for the future of what we want to build at a technological level, um, you know, Google built a trillion dollar business on top of Web 1.0, but nobody's ever going to build even a billion dollar business on top of Google because that's the way their ecosystems operate, right? They own the entire full stack of it. So, you know, Web 1.0, Web 2.0 is what I consider to be the age of corporations. 
bringing intense innovation, uh, amazing new features, but really reaching a tipping point as far as security and privacy goes. So what is, what is Web 3.0, right? Web 3.0 is also building upon the standards of Web 1.0, the open standards that kind of power our internet today. But it is kind of trying to replicate the functionality of Web 2.0, uh, but with a user-centric and self-sovereign mindset, right? Um, really uh, capitalizing on the open source nature of it, the decentralized nature of it, the fact that nobody will own the platform itself a, the kind of replacing uh, error prone and manipulative oftentimes intermediaries with trusted code in the form of blockchain, right? These blockchains are also gonna be user governed. And like I mentioned earlier, the goal of IOTEX and a lot of other web three platforms is to make sure that the data and value that's created by users is also delivered to users and not corporations, right? So. This is the promise of Web 3.0. It's kind of redesigning our world in ways that are more user-centric and user-beneficial. Um, and the important part to understand about this is this is going to be a massive industry, right? I think we're just reaching the, the start of Web 3, uh, but the next trillion dollar businesses will be built uh, in this kind of peer-to-peer -peer decentralized uh, mindset. So that's just some context on, you know, um, some of the problems that IOTech sees in the world and some of the opportunities that we see as well. Uh, but I really wanna to talk to you guys about uh, one device of ours that is really gonna fit into the supply chain mold, I think very well. And that's called Pebble Tracker. So Pebble Tracker um, really is a combination of two types of tamper-proof technologies, right? Um, you may be already a, a familiar with tamper-proof hardware, um, whether you know it or not, right? Um, Tamper-proof hardware is a special type of chip. It uses, light, it uses a isolated part of a processor called a trusted execution environment. And this is called the TEE. This TEE guarantees the integrity and the confidentiality of all processes run within it. And highly considered to be the highest standard for security and privacy for hardware today. Um, it really manages the most sensitive processes in a lot of our daily lives today. A lot of our smartphones or most all smartphones have TEEs built into them uh, to do things like holding your keys, uh, managing your face ID and your fingerprints. The reason why we trust our phones to hold these extremely sensitive biometric and financial and uh, other types of information is because they are cordoned and stored within the trusted execution environment and it never leaves that secure element, right? So things like credit cards, the secure chip on your credit card, is also an example of secure hardware. And for those that are already blockchain savvy, these ledger wallets, these crypto hardware wallets, uh, the reason why you trust them is because they have built-in secure hardware that uh, is guaranteed to not leak your private keys. So tamper-proof hardware already exists today, but the problem is they're proprietary kind of tech stacks, they're closed, and they're generally non, not available to be programmable by everyday developers, right? So um, even though they add security and privacy to uh, solutions, they aren't really extensible the way that we want to see them extended, right? They serve the purpose of um, still the device manufacturers and not necessarily the, 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 the desires from users uh, fully. Um, on the other side, you know, tamper-proof software, this is what blockchain is all about, right? Um, the ability for nobody to be able to modify or to manipulate the actual platform that our code is run on top of, right? And that's really done through the whole decentralization process, uh, the distribution of computing to many parties instead of one single entity, as well as the governance of the network itself that I mentioned. And this is really, um, when you combine the concept of tamper-proof hardware and tamper-proof software, then you get tamper-proof solutions, right? You know exactly where your data came from because it can be signed by the tamper-proof hardware. And once it's written to the blockchain or hashed to the blockchain, then you can trace how it's evolved further from its raw data state um, and used in different types of applications. So um, Pebble Tracker really is the first, I would say the first device that really combines these two concepts of tamper-proof hardware and tamper-proof software together. Um, so, you know, Pebble Tracker is a device that, you know, Nordic Semiconductor and IOTEX 
uh, have been working on for the past two years now. The version one didn't look like this, but this is our version two uh, of Pebble Tracker. Um, and basically it unleashes the power of verifiable data and establishes a new standard for trust, right? In today's era, you know, we're reaching a point in uh, our history where it's, it's hard to question what we trust and why we trust it, right? And, you know, there's a popular saying in the Bitcoin ecosystem about, you know, uh, the mantra of Bitcoin is always don't trust, but verify, right? Um, and that, that concept, I think, is going to proliferate to every part of our daily lives. Um, it's going to, in the future, you know, with all these deep fakes and misinformation, uh, it's really going to be imperative that we think about why we trust things and what type of proof points we need in order to trust things in the future, right? So... Um, IOTEX is really taking this to heart and using this combination of tamper-proof hardware and tamper-proof software to enable next-gen applications that are running on open-source firmware and open-source software and utilizing this tamper-proof secure element on the hardware side to ensure that end-to-end -end trust. Um, it's cellular-based, so it takes any international SIM card and anywhere you can get a cellular signal. Uh, you can get a cellular IoT signal as well. So uh, it's a very global product. And uh, that also, you know, extends kind of the borderless nature of blockchain. Um, so what kind of data can we get from Pebble Tracker? We know that, you know, uh, the Pebble Tracker here, it has a secure element, this box right here from Nordic Semiconductor. It's the NRF9160 SIP system and package. And it's a very popular uh, kind of open, open source kind of firmware, open source hardware chip that's very popular with developers these days, especially for mobile type of cellular IoT based applications. Um, so, you know, really the, the goal of Pebble Tracker is to generate verifiable data at the hardware level, at least, right? So Pebble Tracker, the way it does it is captures and cryptographically signs real world data, including GPS information, climate information, motion and light. So it's a very full 360 view of an asset's environment. And every time the data is captured, it's also signed uh, by the device itself, which is registered to the blockchain. And that really provides a, a new way to verify that the data that you're looking at is real, right? Or the data that you're going to be placing into your applications is real. And if we think about you know, the way that the future automated world is going to work um, without having a trusted input into uh, your algorithm, then you can't really trust the output, right? So this is a really a foundational concept where, you know, we need to trust the data and verify, be able to, uh, we need to have anyone able to verify the legitimacy of the data if we're ever going to reach this kind of trustless, decentralized, automated world of the future. So, um, you know, the TE on, on, on Pebble and the sensors, you know, collect the data, sign the data, the data is transmitted through cellular IoT connectivity um, and then uh, kind of visualized and placed onto the blockchain or made available uh, to the blockchain. So going back to our original goal of the IoTex platform, trusted data from trusted devices to feed trusted applications. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the data side of Pebble now, um, about what we can do with this data, right? Okay, it's great that we have a lot of data um, uh, you know, but the data is really generated by these uh, various sensors on the board, right? We have an environmental sensor, uh, BME, uh, I think 11.6, something, uh, a Bosch environmental sensor. It does temperature, humidity, air quality, and air pressure. Uh, we have a light sensor that me uh, measures uh, light intensity uh, or LUX. Uh, we have a six axis motion sensor, gyroscope and accelerometer. Uh, to track angular velocity and acceleration. Basically, it, tell you, can, uh, it can tell you if a, an asset has moved at all. Um, and there is also uh, two versions of GPS on it. There's an external GPS and there's a, a GPS built into the NRF9160 as well. Um, so with those things, we have a really rich, um, uh, really rich set of uh, data that we can really understand uh, what an asset's environment is all about. Um, so in the supply chain context, you know, breaking it down a little bit. So we know what sensors are built into the board here. We know what kind of uh, data, raw data um, is being output, right? So this external GPS sensor gives us 
GPS location in coordinates. This environmental sensor gives us humidity and percentages, temperature, air, air pressure, and air quality in voltaic compounds, uh, parts per million. Um, uh, it's a PM 2.5 um, air quality sensor, which is actually fairly accurate for such a small device. Um, there's a motion sensor, again, angular velocity and acceleration. And there's an ambient light sensor that measures light intensity in lux. Um, but again, you know, when we, uh, the first thing I, uh, the, one of the first slides I had shared is that, you know, the raw data uh, is not really valuable unless it's analyzed and the insights are extracted from this raw data, right? So what kind of verifiable insights can we gather from this verifiable data? Well, we can, with a GPS location, we can understand the proximity, of course, to a person or place. In the supply chain context, this is very important if you have multi-stakeholder processes and you want to, uh, you don't want to have, you know, just back to back, you want to have a very synchronized way to inform people downstream uh, when you're gonna arrive. Um, of course, GPS location can tell you the, G the distance and the route traveled uh, to optimize different routes over time. And you can also determine whether something is just inside or outside of a geofence. So these are all kind of insights about an asset that you can glean just from this one single metric about GPS location, right? Once we get into the climate side of things, uh, depending on your kind of service levels or your, uh, your thresholds for different things, it can tell you not only on, on a binary level, right? Is the asset dry or hot, dry or moist, hot or cold, high or low? Uh, but it can also tell you how dry or moist, how hot or how cold uh, to give you more um, you know, customizability as far as how you want to enforce your business logic, your business rules, your SLAs. So uh, we all know that um, supply chain is all about transporting blow, uh, things around the world uh, in, a, in a safe manner, right? When we talk about shipping food, for example, you know, cold chain is a very big concept in supply chain where uh, whether it's a COVID vaccine or a fish from Japan, you know, these things have to be held below certain temperatures or are also going to spoil, right? There's also very valuable goods that need to be kept under a certain um, environment or even like cannot be transported um, uh, above a certain acceleration because of the sensitivity of those parts, right? So the environmental sensor and the motion sensor can really give you a full understanding of how the asset is being treated, right? The angular velocity and the acceleration can tell you things like, has the asset been dropped? Has the asset been kept at an upright orientation? Uh, has the asset been moving fast, slow, or not at all, right? There's also a lot of remote monitoring solutions that Pebble, can tr Pebble Tracker can enforce, right? Um, depending on what asset you attach it to, you know, uh, and what type of activities you want to incentivize, uh, there's a lot of different options, but it really starts with having the tamper-proof version, single version of the truth, right? And then finally, light intensity can tell you things like whether a package was opened or unopened. If there's any light readings, that means, you know, someone's opened your package um, and also can deal with things like light sensitive objects, light needing objects like film or plants or things like that, right? Um, so this is kind of the evolution of raw data that's verifiable into insights that are verifiable. So once we have these insights, then we can start to trigger actions with them, right? We can write business logic in more of an if then uh, kind of format, right? So if I am two miles away from a certain location, then I'm gonna send a notification. Or if you know the destination has reached the final destination or the asset has reached the final destination, then I'm gonna complete the payment, right? So these verifiable insights from the verifiable data are used to trigger various verifiable actions. And this is really the footprint or the foundation for automation, if you think about it, right? Um, without the, again, without the verifiable data as the prerequisite or the first step in this process, how can you trust that the actions will be executed in a trusted way, right? So um, even before we talk about blockchain, you know, the, at the, the verifiability of the data that's guaranteed by the tamper-proof hardware is already adding a lot of trust into this process. So even without blockchain, developers can use Pebble Tracker to, you know, bring verifiable data into their supply chain prototypes or solutions. Um, 
But let's talk a little bit about what blockchain can do next to bolster this, right? Um, so this is kind of the overall end-to-end uh, uh, -end flow, right? Uh, the goal of the, uh, the kind of Pebble Tracker suite of solutions is not only to uh, convert physical phenomena into data, but also bring it to the IOTEX blockchain um, in order to trigger different smart contracts. And smart contracts are meant to be tamper-proof as well and open and verifiable by anyone. So it's really, again, complementary technologies as far as secure hardware and blockchain, tamper-proof hardware, tamper-proof software. So Pebble Tracker will collect, sign, transmit this verifiable real-world data uh, to the cloud and to the blockchain. So the data itself can be stored uh, fully end-to-end -end encrypted on the cloud and hashed to the blockchain to prove data provenance and data immutability. But where the magic happens is really once we uh, kind of uh, develop a way to bring this verifiable data to the blockchain in order to utilize, utilize it in smart contracts and enforce multi-party SLAs, the automated workflows, trigger different types of payments, then there's a whole world of automated actions we can apply based on this verifiable information. Um, you know, for those that aren't too familiar with how a smart contract works, you know, the first thing is that, you know, the, the contract itself is written in code and de deployed onto the blockchain. IOTEX is EVM compatible, so any one of your Solidity-based smart contracts can be easily ported to the IOTEX blockchain. And you can also easily write your own with our uh, really great developer tools and IDEs. Um, so just like it says here, you know, an event will trigger the execution of whatever coded terms you have in that smart contract. So whatever set of if then statements you have, for example, if you know, the temperature is this, this high, then I'm going to trigger some type of action. And that's already pre-coded, predefined in the smart contract. So even people that are part of the same process that don't necessarily trust each other it can all be verifiable because they know that the smart contract, they can read the code of the smart contract to verify exactly what's going on and why things happen the way they did. Um, uh, if the thing has, if the smart contract has to do with payments, you know, assets can also be released directly by the smart contract. And the best part is the auditability and the traceability of blockchain can also add a lot of transparency for regulators, right? If there's a, if there's a recall of goods and they need to understand which stakeholders uh, in the end-to-end -end supply chain may be responsible for uh, whatever the, the, the recalled item uh, had a problem with, then they can just study the, the, the actions on the blockchain and also be able to go all the way back to the device that generated the raw data in the first place, right? So uh, when we talk about this flow from, uh, from sensors to data to insights to actions for regulators, you can even go two ways, right? You can go the actions to the insights, to the data, to the sensor as a device, right? So it's, it's really a win-win-win situation for a lot of people. And the only people that are losing is the corporations that really like to play in this opaque ecosystem and not be transparent, right? So again, as the world gets uh, more and more digital and there's more misinformation out there, it's really important that we think about um, why this is important and why blockchain and IoT can help. Um, so, you know, I've talked about um, the general purpose of what IoTex's mission is. I've talked about um, a little bit about, you know, the, the Pebble Tracker device itself, the data it generates and why verifiability is important. Now let's talk about how we can use this in the real world, right? Um, so, um, this is kind of the most common use case. Um, it's actually, we just ran an ideathon uh, for Pebble Tracker with the IOTEX community. We got over 150 submissions. Um, also the Mousebell community. I think there were some really great submissions from, from Mousebell as well. Um, but, you know, one of these, this is one of the top five winners. And I think it's obviously one of the most obvious ones um, uh, where verifiability is crucial, right? Um, I'm not sure what's going on in Thailand with, uh, with COVID-19, but as the world knows, the US is struggling with this uh, and even with the vaccine rollout, right? So um, the verifiability of these things that have such a, a potential impact on the safety and the health of people, if you're, in, in, if you're giving an expired vaccine 
to somebody, uh, that's very, very dangerous, right? So it's not just about, um, you know, who makes money where, but it's about protecting the people at the end of the day, right? So for this real world example, I'm going to walk you through a little bit of that sensors to data to insights to actions type of concept, right? So a real world scenario can be, you know, vaccines or other sensitive materials need to be shipped below freezing temperature. Uh, if you deliver uh, in the future, you know, say that uh, if you're dealing with a very, very important asset, you can layer on different types of incentives to make sure people, you know, take an extra step to make sure that your assets delivered very well, right? So an incentive can look like if you deliver it below an average temperature of negative 10 degrees Celsius, then I'm going to pay you double, right? It's very important to me. So I'm going to uh, consider paying you double or 1.2x or something like that. But if you breach zero degrees Celsius at any time, then I'm going to take a deposit from you because, you know, you kind of disrupted my workflow um, and you're putting my customers at risk or people at risk. Right. So um, the verifiable data, you know, when Pebble Tracker is attached to a shipment of vaccines or even within the cold chain uh, can tell you things like, you know, uh, the verifiable insight is not the, the, the raw data, but it's fitting the specific business case here. Right. The insight is what tier of service was delivered by the person that's shipping these vaccines. Was it great service? So they get double pay. Was it average service, you know, between negative 10 and zero degrees. So it's considered okay. Or was it disastrous and they owe, uh, owe a penalty, right? Um, so this is the flow of data to insights. Um, and what smart contracts can do is you can automate this whole end to end process, especially the payment part of things, right? Uh, you can automate these terms, uh, these coded service level agreements, and it doesn't have to be just a single metric, right? This is just talking about one single metric from Pebble Tracker, which is temperature, right? If you all also wanted to add your own type of criteria for uh, humidity, or you wanted to add your own criteria for light or GPS, uh, these are all things that, you know, if you wanted to set specific terms or incentives for how, um, how the asset is treated, then you could do that at a, a metric by metric level where, you know, the, at the end of the day, the smart contract is going to be kind of assessing the different weightings that you apply and the different insights that you're gathering from Pebble Tracker in order to determine what the automated actions are, right? So um, if you think about this also, not from a COVID uh, perspective, but just from a tracking anything perspective, right? Um, you know, Pebble trackers, even installing two of these in the back of every cargo truck or in the back of or within an individual package that is deemed very highly sensitive, or very valuable. You can get a full verifiable 360 view of that assets environment and use smart contracts to really code what types of actions you want to take on that data. Um, that is a very traditional supply chain asset tracking use case. Again, I think another, uh, you know, I think the, the very obvious use cases for something like this for Pebble Tracker and IOTEX is all about um, remote monitoring and asset tracking, right? So if you wanted to use Pebble Tracker as kind of a, a remote smoke sensor, it has a very high quality air quality. It has a very good air quality sensor that can tell you if there is a uh, if there's uh, chemicals or um, uh, smoke in the air, right? So if you have a sensitive area of your home, even you can use Pebble Tracker to kind of measure that, to measure the temperature, uh, to measure the humidity, uh, things like that. Uh, so whether your asset is moving or your asset is not moving, you know, there's there's many ways to use Pebble Tracker, and especially in the supply chain context, right? Um, but Pebble Tracker is more than just an asset tracker, right? Um, this is starting to get into some uh, more uh, futuristic concepts, I would say. Um, and it really goes back to that Web 3.0 vision, right? To reconstruct what we can do today, but with Web 3.0 technology. Um, so Pebble Tracker, you know, generates these four metrics, but how do we use our verifiable data and insights, right? We talked a lot about um, utilizing and analyzing our data through things like smart contracts, data visualization, uh, in the future, confidential computing, if we want to kind of have uh, privacy preserving computations across maybe part, pri uh, parties that don't trust each other. 
Um, other things you can do with this is, you know, you can just use it as a private data vault, right? There's no intermediaries in between you and your, your Pebble tracker. So uh, just like with uh, UCAM, the way UCAM works as a security camera is that, you know, it uses, um, it uses your identity in order to make sure that all the data belongs only to you, right? Your keys, your funds, as far as, you know, what's popularized by Bitcoin. And we're applying that to your keys, your data, right? So things like decentralized identity, uh, different identity and access management frameworks can let you really own and control your data. And once you own your data, you can choose to keep it private or you can choose to utilize it uh, within a dApp. And the other thing that's really interesting that I think um, IOTEX is pushing is the concept of monetizing and trading your data, not necessarily monetizing in the form of selling it outright in a data marketplace. That of course, I think is something that will be very uh, impactful in the future. But what IOTEX is really focusing on right now is bringing this data to the blockchain and also enabling uh, new types of decentralized IoT use cases, right? So um, I went going back to that concept of, you know, you have the verifiable insight, now you can generate a verifiable action. That verifiable action can be so expansive and so broad, right? But here's some things that I think are very interesting concepts, and I hope you think they're interesting too. So, you know, things like minting new digital assets based on the verifiable real world data, right? Say for example, you know, the NFT space is going crazy right now. Um, but if you wanted to mint a real world NFT based on someone's verifiable GPS location, say that, you know, you went to Disneyland and you brought your Pebble tracker with you or in the future, Pebble trackers integrated into a cell phone case, something like that, then by proving verifiably that you were at a location at a certain point in time, then you can get a Disneyland NFT in a totally trustless way, right? Disneyland doesn't have to trust you. You don't have to trust Disneyland. You guys are using verifiable data and blockchain smart contracts to kind of facilitate that process. Um, you can also trade these digital assets on different exchanges. Of course, in the future, you know, data marketplaces are gonna be very big, but we have to question, you know, why, are, uh, why should we trust the things that we're buying? From that data marketplace if they're not verifiable or you know i think there's already a five billion dollar uh black market for data especially iot data out there probably grown since i've uh gathered that statistic but you know these are very important concepts around of why verifiability is important and what assets can be sparked by verifiable data i'm going to talk about this one next data as a service right of course this is kind of the utilization of data uh, whether it's to trigger different smart contract actions on IOTEX blockchain, whether it's to automate different multi-stakeholder processes and service level agreements, um, things like, you know, prediction markets are even possible, automation, uh, decentralized autonomous organizations. These are all kind of what we call data as a service, right? Uh, but personally, one of my most favorite concept is this concept of crowdsourced data sets. And, you know, IOTEX is really partnering with some really interesting companies that are already building on Pebble Tracker. Um, and it's the concept of this data collective, right? If many people with Pebble Trackers uh, decide to combine their data in the aggregate, what types of data pools uh, can we create? What types of machine learning models can we train? And what types of, uh, you know, crowdsourced assets can we develop uh, kind of bottoms up today, right? I think a great example of this is Waze. Waze is a company uh, that's purchased by Google for I think $1.2 billion in uh, 2013. Um, and Waze is all about crowdsourcing insights from users about what the, what the street looks like, right? Where are potholes? Where are police officers? Uh, where are points of interest? And all of that information is user generated content, right? So, um, if you think about it, why don't the users that helped to create that company or create that service or create that application into the billion dollar company that it is, what do users get out of it? Why don't they own part of the, uh, the, the pie, right? So the concept of building verifiable data sets from the ground up in a crowdsourced fashion, uh, 
I think is going to be a very, very interesting part of the future where contributors to these data sets can also be shareholders in their future value, right? And, you know, this is just a simple schematic of what this looks like. But as I mentioned, you know, we're working with some really interesting companies. Um, one of them is out of the University of Waterloo, which is one of the top tech universities in Canada. And they are building the first kind of decentralized air quality index on their school, right? So this is a very interesting concept. We would love to also invite anyone on this call to pursue is if you want to build kind of a decentralized air quality index, temperature index, or just, um, you know, understand how air quality is looking around your campus, um, is you can definitely do that with Pebble Tracker, right? And also, uh, if anyone wants to purchase that information or to access that information, then you can become shareholders in the future value of that information, especially as it gets denser and broader. Um, it's not really about, you know, pricing your data in fiat dollar terms. It's more about using tokens to denominate your fractional ownership of that data set or that digital asset based on how much you contributed to it, right? And I think that is really in the Web3 spirit, right? You own your data, you decide what to do with it, and you get paid or rewarded uh, for doing those things. Um, another really interesting use case that I love is we are working with a company called Scaleout, and they're a federated machine learning company based in Sweden. Um, and they are trying to use Pebble trackers to train machine learning models, uh, but only with verifiable data. Um, you know, machine learning is a very centralized process today. A lot of the data collection, the model development, and the prediction generation is all done by one party. And that's because it's very hard to trust what data you you capture, right? So the, fa the fact that uh, Pebble Tracker can deliver absolutely verifiable data, it really presents a new option for model developers to decouple the data collection step and the model development step. So uh, we actually just launched our partnership with them last week, and we're going to be building the first verifiable and blockchain-based community-owned machine learning models on IOTEX. Um, uh, where, you know, again, those that provide data to these data collectives can receive fractional ownership of the future value. Um, and, you know, there's some other, there's, there's so many other cool use cases that people were building with, with Pebble Tracker, right? One of them is actually called Pebble Go. Uh, it's kind of like a Pokemon Go style game uh, that, you know, you, when you prove your, uh, it's kind of like the proof of presence. Uh, if you prove your presence at a certain location, then you get a certain NFT. So uh, we're working on some cool things, especially in San Francisco, trying to set up, I guess, different scavenger hunt type of things. Um, but you know, these are all really interesting foundational components, right? I don't want people to think that these are the end goals of these things, but the, the fact that we can have crowdsourced machine learning models, the fact that we can have you know, user-owned data sets, and the fact that we can have maps that you know, are maintained by users and beneficial to users, these are all, you know, just step one, right? Imagine once we add uh, insurance on top of it, or we add some decentralized finance on top of it, then we're really embracing that Web3 spirit that we talked about before, where we're recreating the functionality of Web 2.0, but from a user-centric and user-beneficial standpoint. So with that, uh, I want to end my presentation by mentioning that, you know, IOTEX is a very fast growing network. Uh, our developer network is growing fast. Our users are growing fast. We have real world products that are powered by our blockchain. And what we would love most is for people that share our vision and share, you know, if anything interested you in my presentation today, please reach out. And we are looking to offer you grants to build uh, the future uh, on IOTEX. So uh, there's many different types of grants that we give. Uh, we have a wish list of things that, you know, are more, uh, they're, they're more kind of standard stuff. Like, you know, uh, we have a lot of already great components of our platform, like wallets and explorers and uh, SDKs and IDEs and things like this. But um, if there's something that someone's built for another network and it's on our wish list, we do fund these types of things. But the more interesting side of the grant program is the open-ended proposals, right? Um, we want to hear exactly what you want to build on IOTEX. What are you guys building in supply chain right now? How can Pebble Tracker help you in those kind of scenarios? 
um, or if you just want to join one of these data collectives, you can. So it's a very, very expressive way to, um, to work with the device and to work with the IOTEX blockchain. So I really invite all of you guys to check out IOTEX. You can learn um, a very high level overview of the main concepts at our website. It's called onboard.iotex.io. Our main website is iotex.io. Our Twitter is uh, iotex underscore io. Um, and we have a, a group on Telegram where I think there's about 15,000 members on there. Um, yeah, any any professors or students on the call want to chime in about how you think you might be able to use one of these trackers and any questions you had? Uh, hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, so I have kind of a question for the pivot tracker. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a very secure uh, hardware, right? But how about their speed at which uh, it like uh, inform the user or the system about like there's a change in anything because mm -hmm. blockchain is like um, it's secure but their speed is not so much that's a good question so you know iotex is actually very very fast we do five second blocks with instant finality so uh, that just means that the the data uh so every news every five seconds a new finalized block is minted on iotex blockchain right um oh, as far as pebble tracker the thing I didn't really mention, uh, didn't really have time to cover all the nitty gritty details of Pebble Tracker, but the firmware is fully open source. So if you want to customize Pebble Tracker to your needs, um, you know, you can think about Pebble Tracker as out of the box, very functional, but out of the box, all of these type of peripherals will be fully on, right? Uh, but when you apply these into production settings, you really have to specify the firmware in a way that's very tailor fit to your solution, right? Things like, okay, I want this thing to uh, wake up every minute, every hour, every day even, and grab data and send it to the blockchain, or you want it to be 24 seven, you can do every second even, right? Uh, but that's really the benefit of the open source firmware uh, is you can adjust those settings. Uh, you can have some prototyping settings that are more easy to prototype with and then you can customize it to fit production settings. Um, but out of the box, we, we're trying to create a lot of different um, uh, ways that people can just use it completely out of the box, start to mine some information, mine data, feed smart contracts, but uh, in more professional settings, you can configure it to how, how exactly you want it to be used. We also had some comments on the Facebook Live that someone is actually working on an air quality project in the north as well. So I think 100% uh, we want to see uh, how we can get some Pebble trackers out to these Thai universities. Um, so Larry and I will get together on that and post details in the Facebook group and newsletter. And, um, you know, we can go through uh, and help them prepare a grant through the grant program, mm -hmm. um, see if Mousebelt can help fund some trackers through the crowdsourcing, crowdfunding campaign. Um, right. Awesome. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was excellent and very uh, uh, comprehensible. And um, working with the university, I, I trust that when you're, you're talking a lot about trusted data, trusted everything. Mm -hmm. So this could be deployed in so many projects that we in Thailand are struggling with. Mm -hmm. And just give an idea for my students to pick. And then they, there are many ongoing problems nowadays that we need to solve. And we need trusted data. We need trusted insight and, of course, trusted action mm -hmm. to solve the problem uh, once and for all. And this is would be a, 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 a light to shed onto their inquiries to find what they should do. And, and this is the, the lecture and the presentation that allows my student, if there are some of here in, in this class, in this course, or they can come and watch later that to learn how they can actually use uh, the, the data. And of, of course, from especially from Pepper Tracker to, to, to make it happen, to make things happen. Mm -hmm. I have no tech background at all, but I'm from law background. So I can see this, that 
the statement of if this then could make a lot of things and 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 especially when it is in smart contract it save a lot of energy and and headache and 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 cost and also and and money and well that's the just- thing too right you mentioned you're a, a law professor and i think that is a, also a very important puzzle piece in this whole thing right because- right right the adoption of this, I, I used to work in consulting for five years, right? I know that enterprises don't change their practices unless <laughs> regulations demand them to, right? So yeah. the faster we can educate people on the difference between semi-trusted and fully trusted is when right. those laws are going to change and when those technologies are going to be adopted, right? It's a very virtuous cycle in that respect. So um, exactly. even if there's other f- folks that are non-technical, right? I'm not, I can speak the language, but I'm not a, a technical developer at all. Um, but it requires a full understanding of the business landscape, the law landscape, and the technology landscape to solve this very end-to-end issue, right? Yeah, 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 yeah true, true. Well, mm-hmm. I would definitely urge my student to watch this clip and, and learn because we, we uh, in the class, we, I mentioned smart contract, I mentioned trusted uh, mm-hmm. information and transparency and all that, that 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 are needed when you want to make a legal transactions mm-hmm. in the environment. So, right, this is in- exciting. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, Thank we, you. Should, we, we should chat some more uh, after this. Yes. Or more. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, great. Well, um, Larry's been so generous to offer his time. Uh, we're over the hour now, so I want to let him go. Uh, and also, so generous to share his email and and n- know that he's he's happy to hear from you directly. So I can also just share your email with all of these professors, right, Larry? Yes, absolutely. Anyone on the call, Larry at iotex.io. Feel free to email me. Right. Yes. Super, super great of you. Thank you so much again. Um, We're really excited about this Thai University initiative. Uh, I've been telling Larry about it since we started it. And um, we're all looking forward to working closely uh, with these professors and maybe doing some cool projects. Excellent. Excellent. Great. Well, thank you so much for everyone watching. And uh, again, yeah, yeah, we'll look forward to building some great stuff together. Thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers. Thank you. Bye guys. Kapunka everyone. Mm-hmm. Kapunka.